Okay, we're live. We're live, yes. Woo. Um, Jordan, I just uh, as as we go live, I'm thinking about that you're recording. So you're recording your voice into your doll garage band, I assume. But then you're also recording this Skype call since Justin isn't here, which is good. Correct. Yep. Excellent. So we'll have everything we need for Joe. As I was just saying to Brian, we're just a bunch of fucking amateurs and we're still figuring this out, uh, like, you know, two years into doing this fucking thing. Anyway, uh, Brian, Sal, you are I've been I've been cooking for 16 years and I'm still figuring out shit. So uh, just that's life, right? You're, you're always learning, always figuring out crap. This is true. But you now have professional audio. <laughs> You do. This is your yeah. first time using this microphone, you said? Uh, yeah, this is my first time using this setup for anything. So I'm I'm excited on, you know, number one, to be on this podcast because I've been listening to this podcast since the beginning. Um, but now I get to use my brand new setup. So it's uh, it's exci- it's double exciting. It sounds look great. This, just it, say look. like three three men in America just trying to navigate a global pandemic through technology. Yeah, seriously. How long have you guys been um, doing this podcast like this? Because before you guys weren't doing doing it together in a room, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, since this is, March. Wow. Oh. This was like, I think, one of the first decisions we all made uh, in response to a quarantine. Right, right, right. And have you guys like met up, met up and hung out ever since the quarantine? No? Just, no. I've, I've been around my brother uh, maybe a handful of times, but I'm trying to stay away from all you motherfuckers as much as I can. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to be responsible. <laughs> I, uh, I've i definitely been pretty bad in regards to I've been going to see restaurant spaces like every other day. You know, so you get to the space, you have to see the landlord or the realtor. But I have a testing center literally two blocks away from me. Um, so I get tested every week and. So far, so good. So far, still yeah. negative. That's good. Awesome. And well, you, you're in Manhattan? No, I'm in uh, I'm in Woodside, Queens. So I am like a 20 minute uh, subway ride from the city, um, mm-hmm. like an hour and a half by car, <laughs> if if you want to drive into the city. Even still? Uh, no, now it's like five minutes. It's amazing. I mean, now maybe it's like 20 minutes, but uh, my wife, she works for Amtrak, so she was deemed an essential worker and she's still, they allowed 75% of the work staff to work from home, but she was part of the 25 that still had to show up to the office. So uh, during the pandemic, I drove her to work Monday to Friday and picked her up every single day. And it was just 10, literally like 10 minutes from door to door. It was unbelievable. Uh, But I never, never in my entire life had seen Manhattan that empty. Um, It was, it was pretty scary. It's gotta be creepy. Yeah, very creepy. And it's still pretty dead. I mean, I I drove into the city yesterday to to pick up a friend uh, to help him move something. And it was, it, you know, there were definitely more people than that uh, back in March when I was originally driving my wife to and from work, but still pretty empty. Like even my buddy says, like he, you know, he's been living in Manhattan his entire life and he felt a little scared walking around. I, I, wood it's yeah. it's like i am legend walking around these cities yeah it's like <laughs> e- empty um well you know what's crazy too man is you're you're actually one of the last people that i saw mm-hmm. and like got to give a hug to <laughs> no I, I, or I think i think before before uh, this whole quarantine because th- when we ended the tour in brooklyn yeah you came out you brought yeah. that ridiculously <laughs> addicting mac and cheese which so I ended up taking most of it home because uh-huh. I drove home that night from New York to back to Maryland. Yeah. And dude, I, for like the next three days, I just just constantly like, oh, I want some more. Oh, I want some more. I wasn't even <laughs> heating it up. I was just yeah. eating eating this mac and cheese out of the out of the um, the yes. carry out box. There we go. <laughs> we, we, we have Justin. Woo, we have he's Justin. Here. There we go. Awesome. Hey, Justin. Um so yeah, it was anyway. Point is, it was awesome, and we should definitely talk about food, your absolutely. food, and your new projects in a in a second. But absolutely, I was just telling <clears throat> Natalie that she's like, "What are we doing for dinner tonight? You want me to cook?" And 
I was just, I like just sent a picture this morning of like this really nice, like spinach egg bowl that I made for breakfast Mm. and I'm eating really healthy. And I just like all day have been craving like a, a sandwich or something (laughs) with like bread and like bad shit on it for some reason all day. And I like, and there's certain days where, where like, I feel like my stomach literally needs that kind of substance in it to like, I don't know if it's like soak up extra water or whatever, but like, I like, so I'm looking through your Instagram prior to this (laughs) and I'm just getting more and more angry because one, you're not here. (laughs) <laughs> to solve this problem, help me solve this problem. And two, I mean, your shop's not open yet, but we should talk about that because I want to hear what the ideas are. Dude, those sandwiches look ridiculous. And now I'm hangry is basically the point. So <laughs> thanks, man. I mean, uh, this, I, I guess are we, we're live right now, right? We're, we're, yeah. we're okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I started on this sandwich project, I would say in November of 2019, uh, and I think your show, your your show was around that time too, right? Or no, was that it early twenty twenty? No, that was that was uh, February sixteenth. Was actually okay, the right. show. Yeah, that was my last show that I went to, um, and I'm glad it was that show because it was a big, fun, you know, like epic show, and I love Brooklyn Steel. Um, but anyway, uh, getting back t- to m- my point, yeah. So I started this project back in November, and you know, uh, one thousand percent honesty, it's not my brainchild. Although not to say I never had the concept of wanting to do a sandwich shop before, um, but I'll get into that later. Uh, so a buddy of mine named Phil Kaplan, he owns this company, DistroKid. Justin uh, and I are friends with a, a a great person named Sabrina who's worked for that company for a very oh, long cool. time. Very cool. Does she still work there? She does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. She lives in Baltimore. She was in New York for, I think, 10 years. She's back in Baltimore, but that is her full-time gig, and uh, she's very proud to be associated with them. Yeah. Uh, you know, from what Phil tells me and from every single employee that I've met there, they all love working there. They love working with Phil. Um, they love working for DistroKid. And according to Phil, you know, he's not he's n- never uh, had anyone quit on him to this day ever since uh, wow. distro kid started. So, you know, that just tells you a lot, you know, he really, uh, he really creates an atmosphere where people want to obviously be there and continue to be there. So Phil, uh, Phil and I know each other through the metal community. You know, he's a big, uh, heavy metal fan and, uh, we've just kind of known each other for, for a few years now. We bump in, into each other at shows. Um, he's come to eat at beauty in Essex, a restaurant that I've uh, worked at for a few years. And uh, one day, uh, so summer of 20, end of the summer of 2019, I got laid off from a job uh, in the Hamptons. I'm not going to say where or anything like that, but uh, it didn't end very well for me, uh, which is all fine and dandy. That's life, right? It was the first time I'd ever been laid off in my entire life, you know, not just my chef career, but my entire life. And I've been working since I was 12 years old. So uh, it didn't work out and I needed a job. And I hit up Phil and Phil, yeah, I said, do you know of anything, you know, of anyone, uh, anyone looking for, you know, a chef of my caliber? And he said, no, you know, I'll, I'll let you know. And then literally the next day he hits me up and he just says, uh, Hey, would you want to do a sandwich shop? <laughs> so, um, we, uh, we connected and, you know, we had already known each other and the vibes were great. So I decided to take on the project. And I've just been kind of doing that full force ever since, um, you know, and it's really nice being given the time to really do my R&D, uh, which is the funnest part of my job for sure. You know, of course, testing food and tasting food. And oftentimes I'll make a few extra pieces and drop them off to friends and, you know, get their feedback. And it also helps me because when I make these sandwiches and wrap them up, which they're designed to be taken out and delivered anyway, you know, I will purposely make a sandwich half an hour early and I will uh, make one for myself, one for my buddy. I'll drop it off and then I'll wait an additional half an hour and see how the sandwich holds up. You know, so, OK, do I need to when I slice the bread, do I need to slice the bottom piece thicker, you know, so that when it mm. absorbs all these juices, it doesn't fall apart as easily. I just noticed the Rockers poster behind you. And that's amazing. Uh, yeah, bro. So, <laughs> um, 
so so I get to work on a lot of stuff like that, a lot of little things and work out a lot of nitty gritty things. And in and of course, COVID happened. So uh, I was no longer able to work in my uh, test kitchen that we had rented out. So I started doing it at home uh, to my wife's uh, horror. But we've kind of come to like a, uh, you know, to, to a mutual agreement of uh, how I'm going to leave her kitchen. And funny oh, enough, I, I'm you the just fucking redo chef. the kitchen. Can yes. you just like redo it too? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we moved into this house. Well, let me go back even further, uh, and I'm getting sidetracked a little, but uh, we bought this house like two years ago. I bought it for my father, uh, and of course, you know, he gave me a great deal on the house. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to afford it. But uh, we bought this house, and it was it was a decrepit piece of shit. I mean, it, there was a fucking squatter like living on the second floor apartment, um, and it was rat infested, roach infested, just completely gross hoarder house like think of the worst hoarder house you had ever seen on hoarders and just multiply that by 10 it was it was really that fucking bad so i took over the house and my dad's like well i already started this uh case with her to get her out of there so you're gonna have to take it over so it took me an additional like six seven months to uh get this squatter out and we finally got the squatter out in the process as the marshal was you know booting her out uh, she fucking spit in my face um, oh. it was, yeah. And then he started accusing my dad and I of raping her and like just all kinds of crazy sick shit. And and the and the marshal just looked at me. He's like, it's not worth it. Just she's out like just take it. And like, she's out. The fucking house is yours now. You know, I did my job. She can't come back in there. You know, there's no way legally she's out and there's nothing she can do at this point. So um so I had to take a spitting on the face. But <laughs> with that Thank said, goodness, it wasn't during COVID times. Yeah, seriously. Uh, so it took us about a year to uh, get this house re, uh, redone, renovated. Um, it was basically a gut renovation. And we moved in this past September. So, yes, it was a brand new kitchen. And a lot of things about the house were, were incomplete. But we, like, literally finished it last week, you know, went to Ikea and bought those last few pieces. But uh, nice. uh, we got a kitchen island, which makes our kitchen way bigger and have a lot more space. But, um, you know, for me to kind of test food out in my home kitchen is a little inconvenient. Uh, so my wife, who's extremely OCD, like I'm already pretty OCD and clean and neat and tidy. But my wife, she's an engineer. So she's just like, you know, that times 10. So she likes things very in a very specific way. So when I started doing these sandwich tests at, uh, at our apartment, I was cleaning up to what I thought was a pretty damn good standard. And she would come back to me later and be like, what's this? What's this? You know, whatever. But it's, it's all good. Now we got the kitchen island and, uh, you know, we, uh, things are, things are good and, uh, it's been working out, been working from home. You know, you can't ask for a chef can't ask for more seriously. No, I mean, and, yeah. and it looks great. I mean, Obviously, when you're when you're getting content for it or taking pictures of, of food, it really doesn't matter in total where you are. You know, right. you take a picture of the food. So I wouldn't I, unless you're telling people, I wouldn't know that you're in your home kitchen. It looks great. Um, but I'm I'm curious because so I've and just one sec. I, I've had a lot of I've had a lot of your food over the past mm -hmm. few years um, and everything I've eaten that you've made for me has been ideally like like exactly what i want and i feel like the the spin has always been like a a modern like fusion of of almost like i don't want to say comfort food because it's not comfort food like it's not that style but something that like like the mac and cheese you made me everybody loves mac and cheese to me that is a comfort food but the way that you did it was completely new and fresh and had flavors that I've never thought about having with mac and cheese. That's been the experience I've had with your food pretty much with everything that you've ever made for me. Thanks, um, man. And I find myself thinking about like, oh, what would Brian do? Like, what would, <laughs> what would Brian make? So I've seen some of the sandwiches that you put together. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious, like, are you able to share kind of like what some of the flagships are going to be or like where oh, you are yeah, with absolutely. it and all absolutely. that stuff? So all that stuff is, you know, I post it on Instagram for a reason. And uh, I, I just want to kind of veer off for a quick second. And I just want to say that, like, 
the way I market myself and market my stuff and even where I get my inspiration from and all those types of things heavily, heavily draws from my love of music. Yeah. You know, so I observe a lot of like what you do, Matt, or I observe a lot of what other artists do of, you know, how they handle their Instagrams or how they connect with their audience. Um, you know, uh, oftentimes, uh, especially lately, I've been getting much more in depth in my posts about story, about intent and, and yeah. why I'm doing things the way they are. Um, so as far as, um, like, yeah, as far as my style goes and things like that, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. Like, you know, I just make what I'm inspired by. And typically what I find most fun to put together are is, um, you know, is, is, has a level of comfort food in it, but I definitely want to put a level of refinement into it as well. Um, and, and then also kind of keep it light hearted and not too serious as well. So that's, that's kind of how I always, always think of things. So as far as my sandwiches go, which are all posted on my Instagram and although none of the posts have said, Oh, this is going to be the flagship sandwich for, for, uh, pud subs, which is the name of the shop pud subs. Um, you know, I, I never like blatantly stated this is for this particular sandwich shop, but um, that's kind that's that's more all the stuff that you're seeing on my Instagram is more or less what's going to be on the menu. As far as what the flagship's going to be, I mean, you know, I, I did this uh, beef Korean style beef bulgogi sub. Uh, that's definitely going to be one of the main ones. You know, that's the same that bulgogi marinade recipe is the same recipe that my mom gave me, the same recipe mm. I used on Beat Bobby Flay, same recipe that has sold thousands upon thousands upon thousands of tacos between several restaurants. I've um, had them. Have, I feel like I've definitely had these before. I think I've, you've had it at multiple restaurants, which is funny, too, because you, you've uh, we've known each other since I was at this restaurant called Mira. Then right. I opened Komodo Rooftop, which I don't think you've been to. But no. you've been to Beauty, right? Uh, yeah, we yeah, I came to Beauty, yeah. and where was it that I had dinner with um with Tanya and JP? Oh, that was Beauty. Those, yeah, that yeah, was yeah, Beauty. Was right. Beauty. Okay, yep. I thought so. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, dude, that and I think we had it that night, and it was probably my favorite dish out thanks, of, of the night. I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, there was. Uh, I mean, obviously, that st that dish has a has a lot of story behind it, and uh, you know, went through a lot of evolutions. But um, clearly inspired by Roy Troy and the you know his Kogi food trucks in in L.A. Um, that's kind of where the initial inspiration came from. That's badass. Yeah. Well, I, so how do I get one down here? Uh, <laughs> I first I got to freaking open up a, a shop down there, which is, um, you know, hopefully with uh, with Pud Subs, um, I'll have that ability to finally expand beyond New York State. Um, you know, right. Uh, being a restaurant owner, unless you become a full on restaurant tour and opening up in major cities, you're pretty much stuck in your to your local area. Right. You're not um, yeah. you're not really going to I'm not going to be able to deliver safely to uh, you're in Baltimore. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I'm not going to be able to safely deliver to you, uh, in Baltimore, but I know that gold belly, I think that's what it's, called. I was, all right. So I was going to ask, yeah. do you know how that works? Because I see like, like you can order like, you know, gym steak subs off right. there. How do you get a, a, like, is it a build it your own kit or like, is it literally somehow I, preserved? I have to I have no idea from what I've heard. It's just, you know, you're paying for the most expensive, most advanced shipping uh, ever created, you know, yeah. and I, I have to believe that uh, the farther the distance is, you know, of course, the more the quality is going to degrade. But I think it's a great idea if they can get you a gym sub, you know, within the day. I don't know. Uh, it, it should be fine. You know, something like a sub like that, if you reheat it, it'll taste fine. Um, yeah. there's this, there's this, uh, sandwich place I've been going to that's actually really close by me. It's legendary. It's called, uh, Sal, Chris and Charlie's. And they do this sandwich called the bomb, which is literally everything, like everything that they have in their shop, they put into that sandwich. And it's, it's just one of those ridiculous sandwiches, but, uh, it's, it's still good. You know, there are sandwiches that are just ridiculously stacked that sometimes I find a little gross, but, um, this particular place, for some reason, it works really well. I've never ordered from gold belly, but I'm curious Maybe. about it. And I'm sure, you know, that concept will only evolve, you know, as the world gets smaller and, 
you know, technology advances. So either my shit will get sent to you through Gold Belly or I'm going to have to open up a spot over there, which is the ultimate goal. You know, that that would be even better. Yeah. That'd be you amazing. could just come here and make it for him as well. There's always that <laughs> I, option, you know. Hey you man, friends. I totally could. Uh, you know, I, I, it, it wouldn't be the first time. You know, I would go visit a buddy, and you know, a lot of people get thrown out, thrown off by this. Is when I travel and when I'm on vacation, I like to cook, and it's mm. because I, because I can cook the way I want to, in the sense that. Um, Restaurant cookery and home cookery are two different things, completely different disciplines, completely two completely different things. Now, if you're a professional cook, it'll only help you in the home, you know, but you can't expect a home cook to be able to cut it in a professional kitchen. With that said, though, those are, you know, a professional cook cooking at home. That'll only help them with things like efficiency, maybe chopping things a little faster, maybe searing things a little better, stuff like that. But ultimately... They're two different disciplines, which is why it's really hard to find home style cooking in a restaurant. And, mm -hmm. you know, but I still feel you can put restaurant caliber cooking from home. Right. Sure. But then you don't have the dishwasher scrubbing the 5000 pans or prep cooks, you know, uh, fine, small dicing for you and doing all that stuff. You have to do it on your own. You're at home, you're by yourself or you're with your significant other. It's a team of two rather than a team of, you know, I had 75 employees at Beauty and Essex uh, between all wow. three shifts and dishwashers. And, you know, so it was dishwashers, pastry cooks, uh, uh, line cooks, uh, sous chefs, uh, you know, porters, you know, b between all this staff, and this doesn't even include the front of the house staff. Right. You know, I had 75 people under me. That's 75 people that's going to be serving 10,000 dinners on a Saturday night. You know, I mean, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, I'm sorry, not 10,000, a thousand, a thousand covers is what we would do on a Saturday night. So yeah, you know, 10,000 people coming through the door that we have to you know, they're, they have to sit down, order their food and then get their food in a timely manner. And uh, it's it's not like, um, you know, I always compare it to what my dad does. My dad is a mechanic and he's like, I don't know why you chose to be a chef, because like I can call a customer and be like, oh, the part didn't come in yet. So I'll have the car ready for you tomorrow or the day after. I can't I can't do that to my customer. You right. know, the customer's there. They need their fucking steak now and they need it medium rare and they need it done really well, you know, and, uh, not well done, but cooked properly. Yeah. Sure. So, you, you know, you can't, you can't go to your, when I run four to five minutes behind, because I constantly, I'm constantly wearing a watch. I'm constantly, I always have a clock in front of me with the seconds on it. I'm constantly observing, um, you know, so after we put out a dish, we'll write on a ticket the minute, you know, at the, what, minute hand it went out at. So if it went out at 945, we'll put 45 on the ticket. So I know that it went out at 945. And then automatically five minutes later, I'll fire off the next course. It's that precise. And if I run two to three minutes behind because I got busy or I lost track of things, I will call the server down and be like, listen, I'm running behind. Tell your guests that their food is running. You know, We'll, we'll be up shortly. You know, it's it's that important to be on time and put out things in a timely manner. I don't know how I got into this. I went on. A well, table, but. because <laughs> the difference is when you're cooking at home or when you're traveling with friends, you don't have to worry about those aspects of it. You yes. can really just relax. Yes, that is. Well, you hit the nail on the head, Matt. That is exactly it, which is, you know, so if, if I were to go visit you or any of you guys and go to your house and then uh, we're just chilling. What do you want to do tonight? You know, what are we going to do for dinner? You know, I'm so down to go to the supermarket and buy up some, you know, buy up some stuff and make a simple style family dinner because I don't have to like I can go to you now and be like, hey, it's going to be like 10 minutes more, you know, <laughs> because I've had one too many beers and I'm not really moving as fast as I normally would. And yep. uh, m more than likely, you know, you know, uh, my but you or my buddy or anybody would say like. Yeah, sure. Take 20 minutes. Right. There's 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 none of that pressure. So when I cook at home for friends really like goes back to why I became a chef in the first place, you know, which is the enjoyment of the act of cooking itself. Um, but when you do it professionally, there's yeah. just so many more layers you have to keep into consideration. Oh, yeah. Well, so what's what's the most gratifying part to you? Is it for you? the Like. 
the process of organizing and the plan of attack and the strategy of how you're going to cook it? Is it you getting to taste the end result and being mm-hmm. like, damn, like I can, like, I don't know if you can separate yourself as the chef and the person eating the food to where when you eat it, you're able to sort of get that perspective of somebody who right. didn't just cook it, which is a challenge. Or lastly, is it the per the, the people you're cooking for? Is it their response? Right. So my uh, there are two things that I really particularly love about the work I do. Number one, excuse me. Number one is um, is the logistical and managerial part of it. It's the most stressful part, but it's the most rewarding part in the sense that if I pull it off, I'm like, fuck, yeah, I pulled it off. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. it I there's a. Uh, I, I'm very proud of myself, you know, if I manage to pull it off. But it's also super stressful because I don't always pull it off. And then I beat myself about I beat myself up about it. The other part that I really love about my job and my position is actually teaching. So, um, you know, there's this joke that they say, oh, like those who can't do, you know, teach. But I genuinely love to teach. So I love to you know, adults, not kids, <laughs> Um you know, when it comes to cooking, I really love to work with people and explain to them why something is happening the way it is. And then like the other, you know, the strategies you can employ to either fix the problem or make it better. Right. So um, something like searing a steak. Well, you know, when you sear a steak, you want to make sure that you have a big enough of a pan because if the pan is too small, it's going to concentrate the moisture. The moisture is not going to expel as efficiently. So then you won't get as well seared of a product. So you always want to use a bigger pan, um, even though it's kind of counterintuitive, right? right? Like, why am I getting this gigantic pan for this one single steak? Well, it's because the heat transfer will be much more efficient and the moisture evaporation will be much more efficient. All those little things like super nerdy things are, are things I love to talk about and I love to see the look on, you know, my cook's faces when they're like, oh, I get it now, you know, and, and now they understand like, oh, this is why I should do it this way, you know, because there are so many chefs and cooks who do things just because that's how they were told. That's how we've mm-hmm. always done it. That's how we do things. And it's like, no, you know, you should know why you do it that way. And if there's a better way. Um, you should at least know about it and expose right. yourself about uh, expose yourself to it. Um, Man, you so, gotta, yeah. you gotta, you gotta come teach Natalie. Cause as you know, you, you know, you gave me and Mark a little cooking lesson and yeah. I failed, I failed pretty miserably at it, <laughs> but dude, you gotta come like at some point when travel opens up, we'll either come to you or you should come down and just, you gotta, you gotta try these burgers first off. And yes. then secondly, secondly, I, w- I want her to be able to just like pick your brain about all the things that she cooks. And you- so that way you can be like, nope, you're doing it wrong here, 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 here. Right. Here's what you right. should change. Yeah, I-, I would love to, man. I mean, uh, listen, the photos that I'm seeing uh, of her posting look, f- I mean, they make me fucking hungry. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you're yeah. already doing you're already doing the first right thing, which is like you're, you're creating demand for your product. Right. So if you if you have a product and it makes people want it, then you're already on the right track. So um, anything beyond that will pretty much only help you. you know, yeah. So at least you're definitely on the right right footing. But yeah, I mean, listen, when travel starts back up again, we could totally do, you know, totally get together. And now my awesome. house is done, so there's a place for you guys to stay. Um, there, there's a kit over, over right over there for you to mess around with too in a oh, soundproof sorry. room, so uh, you can Perfect. bang away as as loud as you want. Excellent. Um, but yeah, let's you know once once we get this damn vaccine, we can uh, we can do as many cooking lessons as you need. Yeah, that'd be sick. Yeah, I just it's it, it's such a passion of mine eating food, and it's a passion of hers cooking food at home. Mm-hmm. So we're a really good fit. But you know, she's always saying to me like, "Man, I just want to I want to up my game, or I want to try something new, or I want to learn a new right. technique, or you know, whatever it is." So um, yeah, we'll we'll have to talk about that. Software, yeah, we could sure. we could definitely talk more about that, you know, and I will say this, I'll add to that a little bit, you know, there's always, uh, especially, I feel like, especially this day and age, there's always like this pressure to learn something new, learn something new, try something new. And for me, uh, you know, I learn all my new stuff by making mistakes. I've made so many fucking mistakes. Uh, it's made me a better chef, made me a better human being. So it's like, uh, You know, for every good sandwich that you see on my Instagram, there's probably one or two versions before it that were okay. You know, I I think I've gotten to the point of my career where I won't make shit, you know, but 
Yeah. Uh, th- there were many more years of me just making shit um, before it, you know, things started really tasting edible. So it's literally just like come up with an idea and get all the ingredients and put it together because at least you'll if you, if it doesn't come out right, at least you'll know. And it's a little sad because like you bought all this food and now you have to eat it and it may not taste exactly the way you want. But at the very least, now you know what not to do. Right. Right. Like, that that's that's a very vital part to me as far as uh you know upping your skill, so to speak but that as an analogy i mean holds true for this podcast or any of the other projects or uh businesses uh, that any of us uh you know have been involved with uh, it just takes the audacity to try yeah you know yeah. Um, I, uh, I I really so, love the uh, the guests that you guys bring on and a lot of the topics you speak about. I mean, it's basically people who just fucking hustle. That that that's at least the the vibe I'm getting. Is you guys tend to have all these people that just work at stuff and are not af- you know not that they're not afraid. They just kind of do right because if you don't just do, then you'll never know and the op- you'll never see the opportunity that's over the next hill um, if you don't at least take the first step up that hill. Yeah, I mean, I'm the first to admit. I'm the first to admit I have a ton of fear and a ton of resistance around a lot of things, but ultimately uh, that doesn't win out. Right, right. You know, then it's just a matter of learning to work with that in service right. of of the vision. Right. Uh, hey, hey, they, Brian, I got yeah. a question for you before we before we move from food because there's some other stuff I want to talk about. Yeah. Um, what about what's your favorite thing to eat? Like <laughs> if. I'm, I don't think I've ever asked you this, and I, yeah. like, I know you can do so many different types of cuisine, yeah. so many different different styles. But I'm curious, like, what is, you know, gun to your head, last right. meal, what is it? Okay, uh, so I I make it every day for breakfast, and it's probably not great for my cholesterol, but you know, who who cares? I intermittent fast now, so I guess that counteracts it. Yeah. <laughs> so my. Uh, 11 a.m. every single day, you know, there there are exceptions, but basically every single day for the past, I would say, year, my my go to dish tends to change. And I'll tell you my other go to dish, which is super simple. But my current dish that I have every morning, 11 a.m., you know, I'm all coming off of a 16 hour fast, so I'm fucking hangry. Uh, I take two extra large eggs. I'll put half a teaspoon of kosher salt and uh, and blend that up. Uh, soft scramble that and make a French style omelet. So before I fold it over, I'll put a slice of Kraft white American, specifically Kraft white American, you know, the stuff in the plastic. Oh, yeah. Wrap. Uh, fold that over and then the cheese starts to get nice and melted. I take some whole wheat toast, toast it just crispy, just, you know, to the point where it's like the outside's just crispy, just browning, but the inside's super moist and super soft. I take that out of the toaster, and right when it comes out of the toaster, I put another slice of Kraft White American Single onto the bread, so it starts to melt already, right? So by this point, my omelet is ready. Not melt? Doesn't it not melt though? No, dude, it, oh, melts, it melts so good. Melts. Oh what, my god! What's the, what's the square cheese where you like put it on the burner and you keep waiting for it to melt, and it just like is that's, like that's uh, Gouda doesn't melt, uh, and uh, no, I'm thinking and, like classic square cheese you put it on a you know you're like this is not real cheese i think you're putting styrofoam on your your burger then dude no no no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. and and the goodmans don't do cheese on our burgers yeah. by the way but yeah i'm telling you there's like that square that like barely melts but go on uh well i i do know that uh, there's some like vegan cheeses that there was this vegan cheese i bought once by accident totally by accident uh, i was just kind of like walking by the aisle and i grabbed it <laughs> And I put it on and it never melted. So I was really confused. Maybe it was that. Um, but it looked just like, you know, craft singles, but it just never melted. And it was really gross. But uh, well, so let me oh, finish. But, but there's something that I've been wanting to have as far as a public conversation my entire life. So I'm very excited. <laughs> but uh, go on right, with your I'm point. Almost done. So I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm walking you guys through the process of my 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 <laughs> morning uh breakfast sandwich ritual. So uh, as the cheese uh, is melting on the toast, that my omelet is ready. It's still on the pan. The f- heat is off, but the residual heat from the pan is st- is melting the cheese that's in the center. I slide that on top of the bread with the cheese on it, and I'll do a drizzle 
And some people will give me a lot of shit for this, and I don't care. You can fight me. I put a few drizzles of ketchup in there, specifically Trader Joe's ketchup, because it tastes a lot better. And then a few drizzles of sriracha, other mm-hmm. bun, and there you go. That's my breakfast sandwich every morning, um, almost seven days a week for the past year. And that's like my go-to thing. That's my mm. shit. So are you looking forward to that when you go to sleep? I yeah. am. I'm looking forward to it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. And every now and then I'll jazz it up. Like uh, one day I'll put raw onion on it. The, another day I'll put thin sliced tomato. Another day I'll put bacon, you know, and then sometimes I'll go back to the original egg and cheese version. But overall, that's the base of it. And then you can add like today I put on a couple slices of turkey and avocado on it, you know, just to go a little nuts. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, that's my like go to every single damn day. Uh, when I was still working at the restaurants, it was honey bunches of oats with almond milk, and I would have it with regular milk, but I'm fucking lactose intolerant, so mm. almond milk it is. <laughs> Does the cheese? Well, I guess the cheese doesn't really fuck with it because it's kind of processed and not yeah, traditional dairy in that sense. Right, right, right. Uh, if I with cheeses, so cheeses in the cheese making process, a lot of the uh, lactose is left in the way. Uh, you know, that like uh, opaque uh, milk, milky looking uh, liquid that's left over from the cheese. You know, if you make fresh mozzarella and there's mm-hmm. so um, uh, so I, with cheeses, I don't really have to worry. There's still lactose in it. But as long as I moderate it to two slices of American singles in the morning, I'm good. But if I have a glass of milk, it's it's not a fun day at the office. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not a day at the office. It, it's a day on the fucking toilet. So. So I want to have this conversation. It, it makes me uh, uh, really happy in, in a very absurd way to have this conversation publicly with a, um, a professional chef that's, that's accomplished, uh, such as yourself, Brian. Um, I have never had a cheeseburger. I've never had a cheesesteak sub. And it's not because uh, I have some intolerance uh, to something in it. Uh, it's not because uh, of some ethical kind of a belief that I carry. Um, I just think a lot of cheese, like yellow cheese, is just like disgusting and unnecessary. And I've <laughs> always I've always felt this um, inadequacy amongst yeah. other people because especially Americans, it seems they fucking love their cheese. Um, right. But even uh, someone like yourself, Brian, I feel like cheese is put on this pedestal. So for me to not really fuck with it uh, I feel this sense of shame. Well, why? Like, you know, who's, uh, who, who, whose opinion are you caring about that, you know, you give a shit whether you eat cheese or not or indulge in cheese or not? It's definitely romanticized, and there's an art to it. That's the beauty of cheese making is, it, you know, real cheese making is a fucking art. Now, you know, uh, the big blocks of cheddar cheese, cheddar cheese or you know the the sliced uh craft singles yeah that's that's clearly like american mass you know mass production you know bull crap over at the at the end of the day there's nothing really redeeming about those things other than the flavor you know and the flavor is awesome and there's but a time I, I think, in- but for me i think it's i think the flavor is terrible i think part of it is the texture but it makes no sense that i can fuck with some nacho cheese I love right. mozzarella, like I'll eat right. a chicken parm. Um, but uh, but yeah, like a slice of yellow cheese on a sandwich right. in particular, like with bread yeah. uh, or like a blue cheese. I don't know, man. So, All my so life, if, it's been this thing I've been fighting against. <laughs> so if you're having a burger and I give you uh, and you let's say you come over to my house. And I say, hey, you know, I'm making burgers and I give you an option because I usually do of what cheese you want. So I, I will always have American cheese. I'll usually have some kind of aged cheddar, like super aged cheddar. It's almost granular uh, when it's almost like granular, like Parmesan. And then a third oh, cheese will be oh. <laughs> the third cheese will be like a pepper jack. So if I went to you and said, hey, I know you don't like yellow cheese. You want pepper jack. Would you do the pepper jack? Is it I'd just say no, chef? No. Okay. So is it all cheeses on a burger specifically that you won't, you won't fuck with? It's possible. I think, I think part of it's the, the part of it's the texture of the cheese and the bread is already soft to begin with. It seems right. unnecessary. To me. So what if I toasted the bun for you? I don't know. I'm already feeling like my skin tingle. Like I'm, I, I think, feel, uh, 
Jordan, I think you're missing out on on a yeah. flavor and texture thing too, because part of the reason why a cheeseburger is so good is because you have that extra like liquid kind of to it. Same thing with a cheesesteak. I mean, what's funny is with a cheesesteak, I don't get whiz. I do white American is ideal for me. And it's just, it makes the sub in my opinion. It, it makes uh, the maybe, sandwich. Maybe it's just, it's, this has crystallized as part of my identity. There's a part <laughs> of me that enjoys the fact that it's oppositional uh, right. amongst the, the rest of uh, the population that, uh, yeah, even amongst people uh, like like you, Brian, or even you, Matt, uh, and Justin as well, that you guys are food people. I, I don't consider myself that. So even though I think uh, you guys may like look down on me for uh, holding these I, beliefs, I, um, I, I don't but look there's down a part at you of me, at all. Well, now I kind of wish you did. Actually, you <laughs> kind of maybe like burst the bubble uh, because I, I think I just am oppositional in nature. Um, but... Uh, it, yeah, I could probably eat a cheeseburger, one that you make yourself, Brian, and you could create context and explain uh, why this flavor profile, uh, you know, vibes with uh, this particular bun, for right. instance, um, or, or, or the texture combination. And it could be a magical, lovely experience. Um, right. I would be open to it uh, from someone like you and only you. Um, and maybe that's the whole point of this yeah. podcast for us yeah. to have this experience in the it's, future. It's for you to one day have a cheeseburger made by me. That's the whole point of this podcast. I love it. It's quite <laughs> possible. Look, look, look. It took us 80 episodes, but we might be like hitting something. We're on to something here. <laughs> but look, I, I'm going to I'm going to be on team uh, my brother over here, Jordan, over here, because <laughs> I think I think I'm fucking callous somewhere in, in the brain that tells me that texture of the cheese melted on. And I think Jordan nailed it with the soft bun. It's the soft right. and the soft and that meat tech. I'm like, you know, the velvety cheese, it just has a note to it that I'm like, no, that doesn't right. feel good to me. Does but this run in the family? It does not because I think Our dad will have parents love it. Yeah, they do cheese. Interesting. That's, but, I mean, but, I, this is I've I've been working in this industry for 16 years. I've I've heard and seen it all. I've had fucking customers come in with cards with every single thing that they don't eat and expect me to make something custom for them. And I will say this. I'll admit it fucking annoys me. And if somebody orders one of my burgers and like specifically explains like I don't do cheese on burgers, I'll be like, the fuck's wrong with them? But I will say this. I will say this. And this may be like the diplomatic answer, but I truly believe it, even though I do lash out regardless uh, when I run into these situations, I tell my cooks and my sous chefs all the time. I say, listen, guys, at the end of the day, we are the fucking service industry and people expect to be served when they come through these doors. They expect to have an experience. We have to we have to give them that experience N now uh, within reason. Right. So if they order the salmon dish and they say we don't want the salmon, I'm going to say, well, the fuck's wrong with you? You know, it's like then tell them to order the right dish. However, if it's something life threatening or if it's something as simple as taking out the cheese in the bun, like who the fuck am I to tell you no? Now, would I say like this is supposed to be this way? Absolutely. And do I recommend it this way? Absolutely. And did I lose a little respect for you because you didn't have it the way that I, ex I wanted you to? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, I'm in the service industry, so I got to serve you and I got to put it out the way that you would prefer so long as it makes sense. And so long as I have the ability to do it, I'm going to throw, well, you know, it's um, wait, let me throw a curveball at this one real quick. What's the chef hat called? A toque. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to put my, I'm oh, sorry, on. a tote, a tote. Uh, a tote. I'm going to put my tote on real quick. Thank you, chef. Mm -hmm. uh, riddle me this. If Jordan mm -hmm. comes in and, and you kind of figure out that like, you know what? He probably would like a little pepper Jack, right. but maybe the texture, the velvetiness, the, the saltiness, the creaminess, everything that kind of came with that that specific cheese that you think he would really like based on you asking him questions, right. figuring out more about who he is as a person, what his palate's like, et cetera, et cetera. Couldn't you then as a chef say, you know what, I'm putting the toad on and I'm going to, I'm going to take those same flow, flavor profiles, but I'm going to put them just in a different textural component. So it's not that cheese texture that he so right. does not desire. Right. So, Okay. So if that was at the restaurant and that happened and, you know, you literally said that word for word to the server and the server came to me, I would fucking laugh at the <laughs> server the and out. tell them, get the fuck out of here. Look, what the hell yeah. is wrong with you? I'm not going to make you 
I'm not going to make you a custom dish and chop up pepper so you can get the pepper jack flavor right. and, no, you know, top your shit with butter to get the creaminess. It's like, right. no, I'm sorry. I can't do that. Salt or something. But yeah. this is like you at home, you know, maybe you've already taken your pants off and you're relaxing. And I now always have you're my gonna, pants off, even in the kitchen. See, and I knew and I knew that. So you're going to sit down and you're going to build these flavors because you have time. You've had a couple of beers, your pants right. are now off and life is right. OK to do this. Right. But but of course, we know that you're not going to have the time because you're a man of efficiency. And if you're marking the time down, there's no time then to waste. Right. Right. In trying to now build this new, new thing for this guy who doesn't give a fuck about cheese. So if we were now that we've had this conversation and if we went to Matt's house and did a barbecue and I was going to the supermarket and Matt and I were walking down the aisles and then I'd be like, oh, right. Extra cheese. You know, the Goodman boys don't do cheese. Uh, so, yeah, let's buy more cheese. No, I'm totally kidding. Uh, but, you know, in the scenario where if I made a burger that calls for pepper jack cheese and I was doing this personal thing at home for friends and I wanted to still execute those flavors and those textures, but st but without the cheese, I'll tell you right now what I would do. I would take the bell peppers. I would pickle them. I would probably mix in some jalapenos to get in a little bit of spice. Uh, and then I'll drain that out and use that to put it on top of the burger. But to compensate for the lack of mouthfeel and the lack of um, that creamy texture, I would actually douse toast the bread with extra butter. Mm. So then you mm. still get that fatty mouth feel, you know, you get all that creaminess still. Um, it's still not the same as cheese, still not as good as having it with the cheese. So like I'm an unctuousness, you. the unctuousness of it? Uh, yeah, you know, it has the oomph, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just missing the cheese. So you still get the pepper jack. That's getting hungry. I think, yeah, yeah I think the I'm biggest, craving that. The biggest thing about this, about this part of the conversation that is that we need to talk about is that if you came over to do this and Jordan and Justin came over to do this and you're making this amazing burger and Jordan says, I don't want the cheese because I just don't want the cheese. He's leaving my house and he doesn't get to eat it. <laughs> no, no. But Matt, I think the point you're trying to make and I think this is this is kind of like big and this is something we, we you know brought up a, a few minutes ago. I think part of the experience of someone who is like, you know, an expert in their craft is trusting them to try what they're putting out there. And I think that's the point of when the chef gets yeah. mad at when someone says, you know what, I want the whatever, but of like course. take this off and take that off. And now it becomes this deconstructed non-version of what the person sat in the kitchen or at home, right? In the test kitchen at home and, and crafted this beautiful thing. When you start removing things, that changes the flavor profiles yeah, and everything is balanced in this really delicate orchestra and if you start removing the strings you fuck the whole thing up poten potentially but i gotta say see I've, i i I'm, I'm good with taste i like to consider myself a professional eater and when me and jordan would go to rocket to venus for burger night on mondays mm -hmm. motherfucker would get it with no cheese and what if you said he would get it with cheese what do you mean? Oh, well, I'm he did saying, like, like, what if you were like, I wish you would get it with cheese. I, w I mean, I don't want to lie. I wish he would get it with cheese because as an example, that burger in particular is fantastic. And as a professional eater, he should trust me to say to him, get it with the cheese because you need to experience this. And if it's not going to kill you or hurt you, come on. I now, did you ever <laughs> offer him a bite? Did you offer him a bite, Matt? Oh, I totally would. I don't know if I did. I don't know either. I don't know if you actually uh, communicated that, uh, but now I'm realizing that maybe you just uh, some silently judged right me. <laughs> right? I did. Well, here, I, I, I do want to say, Brian, um, I, I genuinely feel closer to you for having the great cheese debate. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. I'll say that much. It was definitely fun. Um, listen, man, uh, I, I will say this, you know, unless you're going to a place like Jiro Dream, you know, the the spot in Japan, you know, Jiro Dreams of Sushi yeah. or Masa or, you know, a Ferran Andrea restaurant or a Tom Ke Thomas Keller restaurant, you know, these super, you know, three Michelin star year after year fucking legacy restaurants. And let's just say they had a cheeseburger on there. Right. And if we went to eat and you told them to take off the cheese. I may fucking assault you in dude, the middle of the dining. Dude, imagine going, <laughs> Noma, Noma has had Noma. a cheeseburger over the past season. Mm. So imagine going to Noma and you sit down and you tell Rene Redzepi to go fuck himself with his cheese. 
It's so, not, that's just, you can't do that. So I will is, say is this. Nova if it was still in the same place with the, uh, with like the test kitchen boat kind they of have a new, yes. they, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, no. They, I don't, they may have the boat, but they, they move locations. So they okay. have a whole new, a whole new, like actual physical location now. I was always very jealous of the fact, Matthew, that, that I had the book. I think I had the Noma book. I remember this is years ago now, though. But I know you had said, I think you went once or twice on tour, which is just, you know, a, a beautiful thing, a beautiful thing. It's great. And but that's what I guess that's the to your point, Brian. It's like if you go there and they have a cheeseburger, just like everything else on the menu, if you don't have a food allergy, you just got to eat it, whatever right. it is. And then you're talking about tippy the top of like of the restaurant food. Chain. I mean, this is like yes. Noma, right? Rene Rizepi is like if, listen, there is not there is none greater. Right. If we go to Shake Shack or in and out or whatever and you say oh, no cheese, enough. I mean, I'll, I'll look at you and I'll be like, motherfucker's missing out. You know what I mean? But uh, uh, I, I, I'm not going to stop you from it. I'm not going to comment on it. You know, even out of be- beauty in Essex, I mean, we deal with tons of freaking allergies and dietary restrictions and just people being shitheads. Um, but we still have to meet it. And listen, you know, you have the burger without cheese. It's not the end of the day, but you're missing out. I think that's the the, the point is we've, you know, both Matt and I clearly feel you guys are missing out on this. But uh, some people think cilantro tastes like soap. Some people are afraid of heights. Um, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, I feel like you're missing out if you have pico de gallo without cilantro. And if you don't go to, you know, the Empire State Building and take a look really quick. But uh, to each their own, man. I mean, you know, uh, like I said, you're missing out. <laughs> well, we do agree. We do. We do agree on cilantro. And uh, at this point, I feel like uh, the only way that I would have uh, a cheese on any sandwich in 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 my future, it would have to come from you, Chef Brian. Well, I think uh, I think we'll have to make that. Uh, we'll have to make that happen. I think. We, we all got to get uh, COVID vaccines, and then I got to make my way over uh, down to you guys, and we will I will blow your fucking minds with the most amazing cheeseburger you've ever Cow had. Cheese. Well, yeah. for, the sci- for the scientists listening and, and, and the politicians uh, who, who uh, you know, d- create the legislation to, to make this, uh, this, this global nightmare come to an end, if there isn't, uh, you know, if this is not a, a, a just motivation enough, to, to get this thing under control. Skip the trials. Uh, Skip the trials and put it right into practice. I 100% Let's agree. Get the vaccine out here. I heard Russia has it. Uh, real quick, to put a nice bow on this uh, cheese segment of the conversation. Matt, you mentioned, <laughs> this, you mentioned this beautiful mac and cheese, the stick-to-your-rib comfort food mac and cheese. would have. You were wa- watering out your ears, Matt. What was so different? Uh, how did Chef Brian elevate your standard classic mac and cheese. How did he take it to the next level? It had it had scallions in it. It was pork belly, if I recall. Uh, it was a, so was it a no, I brought you cheese? something. It was called uh, the Philly mac and cheese. So it okay. was, uh, you know, it was, it was a classic, you know, cheese sauce that you would use. Um, but we uh, we put um, short rib into mm. it. Oh, that's so what it was. Some, short rib. Short yeah. rib. Short Sautéed rib. Yes. short rib. And then there was some breadcrumb with, you know, some dried spices in it, like onion powder, garlic powder, and the rest I can't tell you. Mm. Uh, and uh, and also some uh, uh, roasted bell peppers, chopped up roasted bell peppers. And that just gets all mixed in at the very end. You know, when everything comes together, you bake it in the oven for a quick few minutes, you know, get a little crusty, you know, get that breadcrumb nice and toasted. And oh, man, I mean, you know, toasted breadcrumb and cheesiness. I, I think you know, there's really nothing better. And to your point, right? That's yeah. that crunch factor. You got to have the balance. You know, the crunch, the textures, right? Yes. Yeah. The crunch yeah. with kind of the smooth and creaminess of the yeah. mac and cheese, yeah, which we know. used like Stouffer's growing up. So now to elevate it with, and I guess this was a question I was going to ask you because I was curious about. Uh, there's so many people that are home that are home chefs that they, they want to eat better. They want to eat the dishes mm-hmm. they love, but they don't know how to elevate them. And of course, I think this is a great nugget of, hey, you can add some kind of crispy crumble that you can then bake right. on top of your mac, you know, on top of a basic mac and cheese to kind of take it to the next level. Do you have any good nuggets that you can provide to everyone listening that really just helps from, from the chef's mind? Just take things, you know, I keep using the Emeril Lagasse term, but kick it right. up a notch. Yeah, uh, I have a very simple answer for that. And it's uh, always remember cooking is a full sensory experience. 
every single one of your senses are part of this. So texture, touch, right? Smell, obviously. You eat with your eyes first, literally. You see the dish, you know, you're going to you're going to know in an instant whether it it looks if if it makes you hungry or not, right? Because mm-hmm. if something clearly looks like shit, like school lunch, you know, you're, you're not going to be appetized for it and then you're going to have low expectations. Now with that said, you know, there have been times uh, well, I, I don't want to veer off into that, but like I said, it's a full sensory experience. So you want to really think about if I add this, does it add to the smell? Does it add to the texture? Does it add to the visual? What purpose does it serve? You know, okay, I made this salad. Well, if I put on a few slices of raw, you know, uh, red radish, you know, it has a very vibrant red outside and very white innard, right? So it has a lot of color contrast. Typically salads are green. So the green with the red and the white automatically, you know, your, your a visual sense has been stimulated, right? And then texturally, all right, well, you have all this um, lettuce and what kind of lettuce is it? So did you use iceberg? Did you use romaine? Okay. Romaine's a lot crispier. Okay. So it's all these things. And then what can I add to the end of it? Can I put some infused, you know, shallot oil, into mm. it that'll give it that aroma so now you've engaged your nasal you know your, your your smell sense of smell so that's kind of what i would think about it's like in what way can i engage my senses more with this dish and i think if you go there and think about that way you can pretty easily come up with an idea and if you're having a hard time coming up with an idea just close your eyes and i do this all the time i kid you not i will close my eyes and i'll pretend i'm walking through the aisles of the grocery store Right. And then you think about like, oh, I'm walking by the bell peppers. I'm walking by this. Oh, right next to there is a blue cheese. Oh, shit. I didn't think maybe blue cheese will work in this or whatever it is. And then you want to take it a step further. Start thinking about the dried section. Oh, let's go to the, you know, import section with uh, all the Asian and Mexican ingredients and stuff like that. And that's kind of how I start uh, when I'm looking to jazz up my dishes is, uh, again, trying to engage all the senses, but also just closing my eyes and pretending I'm walking through the supermarket. And then what kind of supermarket will also dictate, right? Do I want this dish to be more fucking hipster and so I'm walking through a Whole Foods? Or do I want to get a little wretched and go to ShopRite and maybe, you know, put Velveeta in this mac and cheese? You know, who, who cares? If it tastes good, you know, who cares, right? Uh, I can use, I guarantee you, I can make you a mac and cheese using fucking Velveeta, but I'll put on butter toasted pan crumb, uh, I'm sorry, butter toasted breadcrumbs with some fresh herbs mixed inside and you'll mm. think it's gourmet as fuck right you know that's well, uh there's that's not my approach. yeah <laughs> <laughs> look coming coming from a guy who who i typically go to like a trader joe's or an aldi which you know same same parent company i see a lot of the same stuff we went to wegman's the other day you should have seen me i was like hooting and hollering you've never seen someone so fucking excited to be in the grocery store like even Dude, i, I came Wegmans. across like I, I, I love it. I mean, I just love a grocery store, all the new products, seeing like what's new for people to try, what's changed in like the last year that I haven't been there. The one that stuck out was like Earth Balance, you know, kind of a, a vegan spread mm-hmm. for people, for, for the vegan homies that want some butter, now with avocado oil. And like, you've never seen someone more pumped up about alternative butter. So I get it. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the day, Chef, that you, you come to Baltimore, we get to go grocery shopping, Jordan maybe takes a few nuggets away. He did one time uh, make a bowl of cereal. And I'd be curious maybe if you could go back, check that out and maybe comment how he could elevate that. But one time in the Facebook group, uh, you know, he did make a bowl of cereal. So (laughs) I I think this would be very beneficial, uh, valuable and exciting for for all of us here. Uh, Cereal is one of those things I specifically do not fuck with. Cereal is perfect out Mm -hmm. of the box. Whatever it is, Fruity Loops, Count Chocula, Golden Grams, Honeycomb, fucking Matt, what's Oreo your Cheerios. Hold up, before and before we take this home, Oreo Brian Cheerios. and and you guys as well. You need to hit up Mark Holcomb uh, or his wife Vane and have yes. her send you the granola that she's Ooh. working on. Yeah. Okay, it oh, is yeah. my favorite. If the, if granola were a cereal. Yeah. That would be my favorite cereal of all time. It's really? also probably my favorite dessert of all time. Also probably my favorite just like thing to put in a smoothie when you're making yeah. a smoothie. Mm-hmm. Dude, it is next level unbelievably good. 
I so, love wow. granola, man. Homemade granola, especially done it's right. Like, and it's like it's it's based off of like turmeric as the base. Ooh, so interesting, dude. It is. It's I'm interesting. Not All right, next, I'll, next I'll, I'll, I'll text Mark right right after we end this. I'll be like, yo, Matt said get me. <laughs> Matt said to hook me up with some of that uh, granola. Dude, you gotta. It, this could be like the first uh, partnership where you sell it in your stores. All right. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's what's Hell up. Yeah. I love Dessert it. For, desserts by body. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, Brian. I, I, yeah. I was kind of poking around online, just checking you out before the conversation. Um, it seems like a Twitch stream, a weekly Twitch stream. That's yes. that's kind of one of the newer things that that yes. you've been super active doing. Yeah. Uh, so I wouldn't say super active, but I do it consistently uh, once a week on Sundays at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, just look up Chef Brian Sow on Twitch. I'll probably be the first one that comes up. Um, so I started I've been told about Twitch. Maybe I was told about Twitch maybe a year and a half ago. I mean, I was you know, people were telling me, oh, you should get onto this. There's no one cooking on it. You know, uh, you should do it. And now there are tons of people cooking on it. Maybe there were people cooking on it back then, too. But um, anyway, point is, uh, it's just, you know, doing something like Twitch. It's it's an investment and a commitment of time, you know, time yeah. and energy and money and, um, you know, any new venture is. So I wasn't really interested. I did like I did try give a shot to making very strangely uh, making like guitar gear review videos for a short time on uh, YouTube. And then I quickly learned I really don't like video production. So um, mm. I, I, I did I did that for a few months and then I stopped. But um, when the pandemic happened and I was literally stuck at home without anything to fucking do, because, you know, the first month and a half of the pandemic, I literally just stayed home and did nothing. I mean, not nothing. I had to homeschool my daughter. But, um, you know, I wasn't doing any work. And that was the first time in my career I, I was, you know, literally just chilling every day. Uh, and yeah. you can only Netflix and YouTube so much before you feel like you're wasting your life away. So I decided, you know what, let me give this Twitch thing a try. And, uh, you know, what I told myself was I'm not going to invest anything into it. So I have to make it work with whatever I have. So I started twitching with my phone. You know, there's an app and you can just twitch from your phone. Uh, the connection's not very reliable. It's a pain in the ass because as you're twitching, you have to constantly move your, you know, phone to to match the angle. So I'm sure it induced some vomiting to to my one or two viewers at the time. But as I was doing it, I fell in love with Twitch because of the of being able to interact. Um, mm -hmm. That was the thing that was missing from making YouTube videos was the interaction. And then that interaction allowed me to do one of my favorite things in my career, which is teach. So now I, you know, highlight little clips from my Twitch feed, uh, my Twitch VODs, I should say, and I upload them to YouTube, just little nugget, like 10 second, 15 second nuggets of knowledge. You know, sometimes I post some stupid shit on there too. You know, maybe I do hot sauce dabs on my Twitch channel, you know, so for like a 4,000 points or something. I'll take, you know, I get these. I literally have a new shipment here. Hang on. Amazing. So, so I love hot ones, you know, mm. first we feast hot ones. I fucking love that show. Yeah. So I ordered, um, I ordered the last dab. Oh yeah. Hell yeah. Can you do yeah. a dab for us, please? No, <laughs> I'm this, not is, gonna... this is like well, well over a million Scoville units. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that so that's this guy. This is the fucking hottest sauce on hot ones. So I'm uh, I'm gonna put this up to you know for you to be able to redeem. I'll probably make it like ten thousand points, something ridiculous like that. The other hot sauces I have on the channel are pretty damn hot too. But it's fun, you know. I'll dab some hot sauce and I still have to make this dish, so I'm like fucking sweating and sweat's getting into my eyes and you know can barely think from the spice. Um, but it. It makes it a lot of fun for my viewers and for me. But like I said, the best part of Twitch for me was the interaction of me being able, you know, people literally ask me, what's the difference between kosher salt and table salt? Chef, how do you recommend, you know, what's the, you know, how much salt should I put into my pasta water? And then it created this a whole new set of content for me on Instagram because I'm like, oh, people have these questions. So I started doing like Tuesday tips on Instagram. That's mm. so it like trickled into Tuesday, uh, trickled into my Instagram where I'll be like, Hey, I get this question all the time about, 
you know, how do I salt my pasta water? How do you know, what's the difference between salts? Should I marinate my meat or not before I grill? You know, all that type of stuff. So, um, yeah, I do Twitch every week. I was doing it more in the beginning. Um, but as I, I got back to work like a month and a half ago, so ever since I got back to work, I just, uh, and also I have my family and this new house I've been putting together. So, um, you know, I only Twitch once a week, but I do it. I I've done it consistently ever since, even when I couldn't do a cooking stream and I had something to do that Sunday, even 10 minutes from my phone. Uh, this one particular Sunday I was in South Jersey. My father has a farm in South Jersey. Um, like a like a 30 acre farm that he's planning to retire on over there. So I wanted to go over there and like take my daughter to see the farm and all these chickens and geese and you know that my dad has. Uh, and I, I streamed from there. I did a tour of the farm um, and you know kind of telling everybody like, yeah, this is a new venture for my family. My dad's a fucking mechanic who thinks he's going to become a farmer and it's probably going to be disastrous. But you know, get started, just do it, you know, and we'll we'll figure it out, you know. Um, so, yeah, anyway, getting back to Twitch. Yes, I do Twitch every Sunday, 3.30 p.m. I like to focus a lot. You know, I'll make a different dish every single week. I take requests and I'll do it in a future stream. But uh, my favorite part of Twitch is the educational aspect and the interaction aspect um, uh, of it and, you know, the community aspect of it. Yeah, I love, it. I love that you did that, the pho. Sorry, sorry, when you did the pho recipe. I mean, that was thanks, great. Man. Yeah. yeah. And, and I get that. Like the educational aspect of it was was very cool. Yeah, I love doing I had a lot of fun doing the pho one because I think pho is this like, you know, it, for a lot of Asian food in general, you know, for for most of the American population, there's this mystique to it. Right. Because, you know, unless you're Asian, you don't grow up with it. You don't see it every day and you're not exposed to how to make these things. Yeah. So. The only place for you to get these things is, and I'm not Vietnamese, so I never saw how pho was made. So I was sure. the same way with Vietnamese food in specific. You know, the only time I would have pho is going to a Vietnamese a pho restaurant, right? Yeah. And uh, one of my closest friends, uh, he's uh, he's married to a Vietnamese woman, and I went over to his house, and she made this chicken pho. So it was a much clearer broth, not as a, not as dense of a broth. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is amazing. It's so light and refreshing. You know, she, she served it with the hoisin sauce and the bean sprouts and the basil. And, you know, um, she did pulled chicken because obviously you're not going to do thin sliced raw chicken like in beef, uh, you know, where you do yeah. thin sliced raw beef. But, uh, yeah, it was just with pulled chicken, but with all the same exact components. I was like, this is freaking amazing. How did you make it? And she was like, oh, I just put bones in a pot with, you know, spices, A, B, and C. It's all on my Twitch. You know, you guys can see it. Um, or if you join my Discord, I put my uh, recipes on there, too. So, oh, um, awesome. so uh, what, what the hell was I saying? Oh, yeah. So I was like, so how did you make it? And she's like, oh, I just, you know, cooked the bones overnight and put spice, A, B, and C, onion, and garlic, and voila. And I was like, that's it? She's like, yeah, that's it. That's how how you know my mom's been making it my grandma's so she just like demystified this entire cuisine you know this this dish that i thought i can only get at one type of place and i find that a lot of food is actually like that all it takes is just a little bit of education and the right source and you can pretty much demystify any dish i love it yeah yeah i gotta try that one yeah um the the pho the pho broth recipe in specific, Matt, I don't have it on my Discord Google sheet yet. But if you text me, I'll I'll, I'll just send you all the ingredients. It okay. really is easy. Like it's it's one it's super easy. All you need is fucking chicken bones, a few spices, you know, a few fundamental fundamentals as far as the process, and you just leave it overnight, and you have this amazing broth the next day. Okay. So, I'll yeah. definitely text you about that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey. You make it sound so simple, and I, I I follow this guy. He goes by Make Bistro, and all he does is cook. Derek, Thai I was food. just gonna mention Derek, Derek. Food, right? It's like Thai food, Thai food, Thai food, and then he grabs some money and he runs off to Thailand for like two, three months. And all he does is he like observes and he does like a stage where he just I think he just meets other chefs, and so he just wants to learn from them. And then he comes home and he does these like pop up dinners and all this stuff. But he, he goes really hard on his Instagram, and he's now mm. he's got a Patreon. I want to check this out. Who is it? Make, it's, uh, bistro. make bistro dude you'll and he he lives in uh in brooklyn, brooklyn you'll, yeah and he, you he guys does, should totally link up i think yeah, i've heard of this dude he's great he's been on like the brothers green which is like another another big duo or was a big duo out of out of new york you know that were yeah. doing things in the food world but you know i mean 
he he does the same thing that I think you're talking about, which is educate to elevate. Right. Which right. is huge because for all of us, we're all looking like, you know, the classic chef thing. Like, can you balance the, you know, add a little more acid to this with the salt, with the sweet, with the whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of us, we think it's daunting. It's, it's a little overwhelming, you know, oh, I don't know how to do this. I go to the restaurant, like, you know, to your point of it, it seems this like there's like this, you know, mist around all this stuff and you can just demystify it when someone just takes the time to educate. So, I mean, I commend you for, for what you're doing because so many people want to be able to make that chef quality food in their house. So, so to be able to take the time and, and educate people is, I mean, it's huge. I mean, I will say this, man, there are more home chefs than there are professional chefs on this planet earth. That's number one. Number two, there's more shitty chefs than there are good chefs. That's, you know, that's number two. And number three is, uh, I think the only people, uh, the only thing stopping people from achieving their quote unquote food goals is themselves. It's just like working out, right? Like, you know, the only thing that's stopping you is you, right? Right. If you don't work out, you're not going to look better. You're not going to feel better. It's just that fucking simple, you know? So if you don't put in the work, it's not going to happen. The same exact thing is, I mean, Matt's drums, right? You have a student. They only they literally only practice when they see you. Right. You yeah. have you've had students like that before. Oh, yeah. Why am I not getting better? Why can't I play like, you know, well, it's because you didn't practice. You didn't put in the work. You know, I, I when I used to um, uh, when I used to have bands or, you know, uh, so long story, I won't get into it. But I used to be a praise leader at a church when I used to go to church. So I would teach all these kids how to play these instruments. And then, you know, when it comes to Sunday, you know, to Sunday service, and then they they play like shit. And I'm like, you know, did you practice? Yeah. And they're like, no, I thought I just practiced before, you know, uh, 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 you know, before. The uh, what the hell? Yeah. Yeah. Before the gig. And I'm like, no, you know, you have to practice even at rehearsals. I'd be like, you have to practice for practice. You have to practice for your rehearsals. You got to put have in the work. Practice. You got to put in the work. And it's yeah. the same thing with cooking. So um, but at the at the end of the day, it's a lot simpler than most people think. The most daunting part is just getting started. So just like I demystify, you know, I like pho was demystified as this like, yeah, matter of fact, it is that simple, you know, by mm-hmm. someone who's been making it their entire lives. That was actually one of the key moments. Uh, and shout out to Alice Tian uh, that she's the one that showed showed uh, told me how to make that broth and my buddy Eric Chow. Um that was actually a very significant moment for me, which was like, oh, shit, you know what? If I maybe spent like an hour, you know, really just trying, I could probably demystify a lot of things. You know, mm-hmm. I could probably accomplish a lot more and learn a lot more about certain dishes rather than thinking like, well, you know, uh, I don't know how to make Vietnamese food because I'm not Vietnamese. Bullshit. You know, you just you guys just told me about this dude. What's his name? Derek? Yeah. You know? White dude going to Thailand. I mean, yep. that's the fucking definition of taking initiative. And, you know, maybe he doesn't make it exactly like, um, you know, that that old Thai lady, you know, on the street who's been making that exact dish every day of her fucking life. But I guarantee you, you know, even I will find it delicious as fuck because he put in he the, puts the he puts the work in. Yeah, oh, yeah. I think that's like I mean, if, if we had to break this down, you know, kind of. Uh, summarize this. It's really, you just got to put the work in. And it's like, I keep thinking about Tim Ferriss had that book, the, the, what was it? The four hour, four hour work. Four hour week. Yep. Yep. No, not four hour work week. Cause he had oh. the four hour Tools of Titans. No, no, no. Oh, four, had, oh, four hour chef. The four hour chef. Four hour yeah. chef. And he talked about how all it was, was like, I had to buy a bag of onions and just practice cutting the onion or <laughs> dicing the onion. Yeah. Things that, that are really easy to like the sous chef, the prep chef, whatever. But to your average home cook, they're like, man, dicing the onion, having to like go in this way and then kind of go this way. Right. Knife skills can be really daunting. But if you put the work in and the nice thing is like a bag of onions is relatively cheap. Right. Because right. sometimes I think about from like the dietitian world, I watch a lot of dietitians. They, they're really into recipe creating and curating and they probably mess up that recipe that they're coming up with trying to make that, that great recipe. 50 times until they like make it. And they're like, you know, I tweak this, I tweak that. I finally got it right. Especially right. In baking with all the chemistry you can end up. And I've done this plenty of times. You spend so much money on these good ingredients and you keep messing it up. And that can definitely be a little demoralizing, but like for your average person who just wants to get a little, little bit better, like you can get those knife skills up by buying like cheap bags of, of vegetables and, and working on it. And there, I'm sure there's a thousand, you know, different resources now available at our fingertips, just going on YouTube, 
you know, and then going on Instagram, finding guys like you, finding guys like Derek, who, who can probably take like a very specific dish and really break it down. Then, I mean, there's nothing stopping us now of getting better at this. Yeah. I'm fucking and starving. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll add a, I'll add one more thing to that, which is, um, you know, the, the way I work mentally is typically I work backwards. So I, I, I think of exactly what I want and I deconstruct it. Right. So like, what's the ideal thing that I'd like, like this home studio that I finally finished building out. It's like the exact creator hub that I've always wanted for my musical side, you know, like everything I could, but it took me fucking 15 years to like curate all this equipment between the speakers and the desk and all that bullshit. Even this webcam that I just bought recently, you know, it took me 15 years of just piece by piece, piece, piece by piece. However, I wouldn't have built it unless I had that grand picture. So I think it's the same exact way with food. So one suggestion I may have to the new cook and listen, I don't use pre-cut vegetables. Like I, I don't use, you know, because I can cut it myself pretty fast. But if for to make it easy for the average person at home who wants to get into cooking, who wants to eat just natural foods, you know, and if something like dicing an onion is daunting to you, go to go to Trader Joe's or half these or Whole Foods and buy the pre-cut stuff. I know people are like probably cringing right now, but I'm talking to the person who just wants to get started, who doesn't have a single knife skill, you know, think of the ideal dish you want first and then work backwards. So what are the ingredients you need for that? Oh, I need potatoes. I need onions. Oh shit. I need to cut all this stuff. And I don't even know how to hold a fucking pen right anymore. Cause I've been using my iPhone for so goddamn long, you know, then, you know, buy the things that'll make it easier and start yeah. there. Just cook, just, just cook, you know? And, um, it probably won't be very good. And, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to what you said uh, earlier, Justin, about, you know, you, you uh, bought all these ingredients, you end up fucking it up, but it's all in the pursuit. Well, if you want to get good at cooking, you have to start the pursuit. And y there are things you can do to make that pursuit a little bit easier. And I think if you start that way, you will be su pleasantly surprised. Yeah, look, I think that's really uh, valuable imparting wisdom, um, not only just the idea of just starting, and we've chatted uh, about that from different perspectives in this conversation, um, but having a vision in mind of where you want to end up, whether it's a, a home music studio or a business or a relationship uh, or a podcast uh, about pastries in which we never talk about pastries. Um, yo, Chef Brian, Thank you so much for uh, giving us your time today. You are a oh, lovely yeah. man. Thank this was, you. Uh, guys. Super fun. Um, I will go to bed this evening uh, with a smile on my face for the great cheese debate that I got to take <laughs> part in unknowingly prior to this conversation. Um, and and the, the Instagram, Discord, Twitch, all that will be linked in the show notes. So if you're listening or watching me right now, uh, you can literally click on the links uh, hyperlinked in the text. In the show description, whether you are watching on YouTube.com slash chocolate croissants or in your podcast app, uh, we also have a Facebook group, Facebook.com slash groups slash chocolate croissants. It is a private Facebook group. You are welcome to join us and a few thousand uh, creative, inclusive, uh, kind, uh, intelligent people from around the world. Uh, Brian, if you're not part of the group and if you're on Facebook, you are welcome to join us there as I am well. part of the Facebook group. My, I'm mad. Yeah. Love and it. I, Love I got, I just got a comment. Uh, that was fucking amazing. That was a great little it's monologue. New. It was just, <laughs> it's new it was, every that time. Was so yeah. good. That was so linear and smooth and fucking kudos to you, man. <laughs> well, thank you, brother. Once Matt said how hungry he was, I realized that if I don't take this home sooner than later, uh, <laughs> he may throw his laptop against the wall and we would not want that. But I am going to say, uh, before we leave, uh, the, the three of us have a friend uh, named Alex. He has been uh, on Twitch just about every single day playing Fortnite for the past few months. Uh, yeah. He has branded himself as Milk Stevens. Uh, you can pay a certain amount of points and he'll dump a gallon of milk uh, over his head. But I'm thinking with uh, the hot sauce and the milk, there might be some branding synergy between the two of you. Nice. What's, uh, what's his uh, Twitch profile called? Milk <laughs> Stevens. Milk Stevens. That's awesome. <laughs>
That's, that's awesome. so good. So, I love it. We're always, uh, we, you know, we got to support. We got to support our friends. Got, uh, that got to you know, support. Yeah, and uh, uh, I, I got to say, every, everyone on uh, Milk Stevens got it. Uh, everyone on Twitch, uh, let me just give a shout out to them really quick. Everyone on Twitch is so fucking super supportive. And if it wasn't for, you know, a lot of my Twitch regulars who are now regulars, um, I wouldn't be as motivated to do what I, you know, do what I do now on Twitch. They're just very supportive. I, I don't see anybody giving anyone shit. You know, they're just a very positive, awesome community. So Dark Virus, Human Sheep, Being Awake, uh, you know, D Delay Photo, uh, Infectious Karma. I know I'm forgetting a few others, but uh, thank you guys. You guys are. Uh, oh, Jody Sinclair. You guys are fucking awesome. Thank you very much. Amazing. That's what it's all about. You know, I, I saw some of your Facebook posts and, and I see that you are intentionally trying to create a positive, intentional community. I also saw you uh, just posting about mental health in general. So much respect for doing that. Uh, Chef Brian, he has been our guest. Uh, we will be back next week with another episode of the Chocolate Croissants podcast. Um, I am going to throw these bells oh. across the room. We have a chef, so I'm going to throw this banana across oh, the God, room. Oh, God, the poor banana. The you can make banana I'm bread the with that. Five times. Yo, yo, we can still make the bread. We can <laughs> still make the bread. No judgment here. It's a clean floor. The cowbell, five times, Ten five times. times, five times. TED Talk, one, two, three, four, five. Another five for the drummer, Matt. <laughs> now I'm going to say... Oh, bye-bye.